welcome. We have a fun and interesting show for you tonight. We're going to be talking about monarchs. We're calling it Monarchs in a Changing World after my guest's book title. My guest is one of the top monarch scientists in our country. Karen Oberhauser is with me. She's a professor at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife, and Conservation. Delighted to have you here. And um, before we say anything else, I wanted to congratulate you. Um, Karen won a wonderful award in 2013, and it's called the White House Champion of Change. And um, thank you. What, that was quite an great, honor and very exciting. Great thrill, yeah. huh? Yeah. And she also was excited, I think, when her face was on in an article about her work on the front page of our Star Tribune back a month ago, just recently. And I want to hold that up. So if you saw that, you can uh, feel that we are um, pushing ahead here with learning more. <laughs> After I saw this article, I thought, I've got to get Karen on. Thanks for having me. <laughs> You're so welcome. Um, why is the study of monarchs so important, Karen? What would you? Well, I think there are a lot of ways to answer that question. And certainly, from my perspective, I'm a conservation biologist. So I'm always looking for things that will increase people's connections to the natural world. And I think for many people, they have memories of seeing monarchs as a child. Maybe they raised monarchs as a child, or they studied them in school. So they have this natural connection to monarchs, which makes them connected to nature and thus care about nature and be more willing to conserve it. So from my, when I put on my conservation biologist hat, that's the way I would answer that question. But I think I'm also a research scientist. So the study of monarchs, just learning about their biology, has taught us so much about the natural world. It's taught us about um, insect migration and genetics, insect genetics, and how different populations are related to each other, and interactions between host plants and insects. So there are just so many things that we've learned from monarchs about kind of how the world ticks. Mm -hmm. So that's important, too. So kind of depending on your perspective, you'd probably answer that question in a different way. I read, too, that I believe you were the person that um, was quoted saying that the monarch is kind of a flagship insect. Right. It's kind a flagship of. insect because people recognize it and care about it. It's very familiar. It's not threatening. Nobody, mm -hmm. well, not very many people. There are a few people I've met who are afraid of butterflies, but very mm -hmm. few. So we have this organism that people just have a natural affinity to. And that's, that's what makes a good flagship species, is one that people just naturally care about. Is the monarch uh, in danger of being an endangered species? Well, there's actually been a petition submitted to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to list, to officially list monarchs under the Endangered mm -hmm. Species Act as mm -hmm. a threatened species. Um, it's something that the Fish and Wildlife Service is considering right now, whether mm -hmm. it warrants listing and thus federal levels of protection. But certainly, monarch numbers are declining. And this is something that people notice all the time. I just, you know, almost daily have people say to me, I used to see so many monarchs and I'm not seeing them anymore. So we have what people notice that the numbers are declining, and also we have data that the numbers actually are going down. So can yes, you, they're declining. Can you give me a percentage uh, in terms of how much they've gone down in the last five yeah. years? Or? Yeah, so what we can do, the only time that, that we can really assess the size of the whole population in the eastern United States is when they're all together overwintering in Mexico. And then what people do is actually go and measure the area on the ground that's covered with trees that are full of monarchs. So literally, you can walk around with a GPS unit mm -hmm. and mark the area that these, these monarchs, that they just cover the trees. The trees are just literally covered with, with thousands and thousands of monarchs. And are we talking acres? So or? we're talking acres. Um, it's okay. measured in hectares because it's in Mexico. Mexico. Uh -huh. So hectare is, we can kind of translate it to a little more than two acres. Okay. And um, 
the the highest that they were ever measured was 18 hectares, and that was back in 1996. Mm -hmm. And in 2013, it was down to 0.67 hectares. Ooh. So that's a that's decline a huge... of over 90 yeah, percent. Of huge... course, the numbers go up and down. It's not you know just a straight line going down. Right. There's sort of you know zigzags. The population some years is higher than others, but we have this overall declining trend, which is really concerning. Mm -hmm. So would you? say yes, they should be considered endangered? Well, I, I, think it's, I think that they are listable because the population over a significant portion of its range is declining. Um, there is some concern over what listing would actually mean for a species like monarchs because they occur in so many areas, so many different kinds of habitats and over such a broad region. So what would it really mean to, to list a species mm -hmm. like monarchs? And that's, that's the kind of thing that the Fish and Wildlife Service is struggling right now exactly. Mm -hmm. Like any species that comes up for listing, there's a lot mm -hmm. of conversation and a lot of seeking the opinions and knowledge of experts. So it'll, it'll be very interesting to see whether they're listed or not. And it can get to be rather political when we're talking about some species, you know, I think wolves and um, the wolf cattle issue and so mm -hmm. forth, but monarchs, I, I would think, would not be too political. Well, yes and no. So uh -huh. it's not, I don't think anyone would argue that they, that monarchs aren't important to protect, um, but it can still be political because people aren't really sure what it would mean to protect monarchs. Would that mean that mm -hmm. if you have some milkweed plants growing in your backyard, you couldn't peel them out? That's the kind of thing that people are concerned about. Oh, I see. Um, what would it Over mean? Over involvement of right, so, federal government. Right. But uh, on the other hand, having the protection of the federal government and federal agencies can be very important um, mm -hmm. for a species. So. I'm pretty okay. sure those are the things that the Fish and yeah. Wildlife Service oh, is thinking about. Um, we had Marla Spivak on recently, and she, some of you will remember her interview, um, is a bee expert. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's a parallel problem with the declining population. Are there some things that are very different, though, in terms of the worries we have for the bees and the worries we have for the monarchs? Well, in a lot of ways, um, the situation for bees and monarchs is quite similar in that they're um, driven by a lot of the same things, that, that the same things that are good for bees are good for monarchs, and that's habitat that has a wide variety of native nectar sources. Um, milkweed is a great nectar source for bees, for native right. bees. So the same kind of habitat is good for both of them. I think that Bees are probably more threatened by insecticides than monarchs are because they're feeding pollen to their larvae. Um, so th there, there are more concerns with, for example, the neonicotinoids, which can certainly hurt monarchs, but monarchs aren't feeding for, for the most part on crop plants, which are treated with a lot of insecticides. Right. So there are certainly some different threats, but the same actions would benefit both bees and monarchs. So increasing the amount of available habitat, not using insecticides, um, you know, just making sure that we're, whenever possible, providing good conditions for both of these groups of species. So certainly there are a lot of parallels between bees and monarchs. One of the things I read about in, in getting ready to have you on was that climate change and the warming of our area and our globe um, is a big threat to monarchs. And I believe you were quoted, again, I'm mm -hmm. thinking I'm remembering right, that within 30 years, southern Minnesota may not be suitable for monarch habitat. Mm -hmm. Um, is that correct? Yeah, so even up as far north as the Twin Cities, just a little bit north. So what we did is we um, used a, a modeling technique to look at the kinds of habitat and the, and the kinds of environmental conditions in places where we find monarchs now. And what we find is in areas where it's very hot in the summer, monarchs tend not to be there during the hottest part of the summer, but instead they've moved further north. 
So right now, we don't see monarchs, for example, in Kansas or Nebraska or Oklahoma during the heat of the summer, during July or August, but we do see them in the Twin Cities. Right now there are monarchs out in the Twin Cities, but um, a lot of climate models predict that the southern part of Minnesota will be kind of like Kansas in, mm -hmm. in 2050. So we're getting to where that's almost you know, 35 yeah, years from now. It doesn't sound so far I know, away it doesn't now, does sound it? that far. No. And, and the, the current climate change models predict that the temperature conditions would be hotter than what monarchs are using now. So that's, that really kind of puts climate change in perspective. I think we think mm -hmm. a lot about how climate change affects us as humans. I mean, we think about flooding and disease and, you know, all of these different impacts fires. on humans. Mm -hmm. Fires, mm -hmm. there are a lot of things, but they, climate, a changing climate really affects a lot of organisms, especially insects that are, th their body temperature is regulated by what's outside. They're what we call cold-blooded. So they're not like us, we can regulate our body temperature because we're warm-blooded. Um, but um, insects can't, so they, they have narrower um, climate requirements. We call it an en a climate envelope where they can survive well. Um. So if they had to move into northern Minnesota, that means they have to migrate further to Mexico. Does that affect the success of, I mean, are they already at their limits for how far they can comfortably migrate? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. And we know that monarchs are found further north. Monarchs are found in northern Minnesota. Monarchs are found even into Texas, or I mean, into Mexico. Or, into Canada, Canada <laughs> north of us. I'm getting my. <laughs> good thing we're not talking about geography here. <laughs> but so they're found. They're found a fair ways north of us, and those monarchs can migrate all the way down to Mexico. And we don't really know what effect that would have on the whole population. Mm -hmm. So, the vast majority of them would have to migrate farther than they do now, and how that would affect the population. It's kind of like. We're carrying out a big experiment, and we don't know the That's answer to scary, the experiment. That's scary, isn't it? It is. Um, I was thinking about the, the temperature issue and thinking about Mexico, and I think of Mexico as very hot mm -hmm. and dry. But you said to me, where they go in Mexico is actually into the mountainous area where it's not so hot. Right. So, so that was it's, important for my understanding of It is very interesting. The temperature yeah, issue. and I when when we think of Minnesota in the winter time, we're in a freezer, a deep freezer. Mm -hmm. And no stage of monarchs, the eggs, caterpillars, chrysalids or adults can withstand those freezing cold conditions that we experience in Minnesota. Um, but they go south and they go don't go to conditions that are warm like we have in the summertime, but they go to conditions that are kind of like a refrigerator. Mm -hmm. So it's not a freezer, but it's a refrigerator, and that allows them to stay alive all winter long until the next spring when they can re-migrate north. So temperatures in the 30s, 40s, even uh, yep, down yeah. in, the, in, in Mexico. Yeah, and it might be interesting now to kind of think about this whole annual cycle of monarchs. Yes. So they have, it's, it's amazing for an insect. So as most people know, they migrate in the winter time. And 3,000 miles. Yeah, long, long 3, distance. 3,000 miles. Central That's, Mexico. Yeah. So if we think of a monarch that you might see in your backyard in Minnesota in August, that monarch is not going to mate and lay eggs right away like its mother and father did. So that monarch will fly all the way to Mexico. It will spend the whole winter there. They'll maybe arrive there in early November, spend the whole winter there, and then migrate back north in the spring and start laying eggs in the southern part of the United States. So as, moves, as it moves into Texas, it'll start laying eggs and kind of move as far north as it can, but then it dies because it, it has lived its whole life. And then its offspring, the eggs that it lays will develop into butterflies and move north, maybe back into Minnesota or anywhere in the northeastern part of the country. And then they have two or three generations up here that don't migrate at all. 
And they only live a month. And they only live about a month. That is so fascinating. So that migratory generation can live eight or nine months, where the non-migratory generations only live about a month as an adult. So, and then the cycle starts again. So we have, counting the one that's born in the South, we have four or five generations of non-migratory individuals, and then we have this migratory generation. So it's, it's really an amazing life cycle. And, and you wonder, what makes the migratory monarch what it is? I mean, why is that mm -hmm. monarch so strong and resilient that it lives nine times as long? So, well, it's responding to environmental cues. So it, it responds to things like day length and temperature and the condition of host plants so that it can live, so that it, it basically knows. I mean, I'm using, I'm being anthropomorphic here, mm -hmm. but it can, um, it, it doesn't develop reproductively and then it can migrate. And what's different about it is there's two things that allow it to live so long. First of all, it's not investing a lot in reproduction. So mm -hmm. for any organism, reproduction is, is expensive. Um, as anyone who's had a baby physically. knows, it's physically expensive. expensive right. So um, the individuals that put off reproduction can live longer. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is it's going into these cool conditions in Mexico that allow it to survive for a long time. Its whole mm -hmm. metabolism just slows down and lets it live longer. And both males and females are in this nine month right. hardy sort of, period, right? Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. and they don't. It's only until the, after the winter is over that they become reproductive. So it's a hormonal shift in them. They become reproductive mm -hmm. and then they're able to mate and lay mm -hmm. eggs and then the next generation can start. It's just fascinating. I, I love hearing you describe this. Um, what can we do as individual citizens? And I use the word citizen carefully because you've really written and lectured and talked about citizen scientists. Mm -hmm. um, but give us some one, two, three, four things that average people can do. Okay. so. I think the first and most important thing that people can do whenever possible is to um, either create habitat for monarchs and, uh, and pollinators and bees, um, put in native plants if they have a yard in their yard or if they can work at a nature center or if they can convince their city council, wherever possible, to create more monarchs for habitat. So that's the big one. And the second one, as you mentioned, is get involved in a citizen science project. So we have thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people in the United States who are collecting data that help us to understand how monarch populations are doing, what kinds of habitats are best for monarchs. Um, so there, at the end of the show, I think you'll show a list of websites, right. and one is the Monarch Joint Venture, and that has a list of different citizen science projects that people can get involved with. And we have one at the University of Minnesota called the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. That you where founded. I founded with mm -hmm. a graduate student. Uh, and so people can go out and they basically look at milkweed plants, um, which are the kinds of plants that monarchs lay their eggs on, and count how many eggs and caterpillars they see. So that's the second big thing that people can do, is help contribute data. And the third thing is that they can educate other people and advocate for monarchs. They can, um, you know, if they're teachers, they can talk to students. If they have neighbors, they can talk to their neighbors or their children or their grandparents mm -hmm. and just learn about monarchs because really preserving monarchs is going to take the concerted effort of many, many people. It can't just be government agencies or um, you know, people that often carry out conservation. It's got to be a citizen effort. So anything we can do to, to talk to other people and get, in, get them involved with this. And the fourth thing is donating money to any organization that preserves habitat. There are some organizations that work specifically to conserve monarchs, but there are lots of great organizations that are really working to promote habitat. So, Nature Conservancy, there are just a lot of organizations. So, you know, people can, can kind of pick from that list and, and do whatever they're and comfortable with. that will be with. on the Monarch Joint Venture mm -hmm. website? Yep, there's a part of it that says, how can you help? 
you know, President Obama recently pushed through or helped push through um, planting more milkweed. Mm -hmm. But I was um, disappointed when I read that we can't plant milkweed in fields that that have been used for agriculture. Is is that well? Am I milkweed won't right? grow in agricultural fields. So if the field has been used for agriculture and it's been pulled out of agricultural production, certainly milkweed mm -hmm. can grow in those areas. Oh, um, okay. So planting milkweed in an area that was formerly agriculture will work. So okay. the point that he was making with that is that fields that have um, corn and soybeans in them, there used to be some milkweed growing in right. those fields, but that Just milkweed is a gone. A weed, really, right, in as the a weed. of the farmer. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that milkweed, now the, um, farmers can treat those fields with herbicides that kill the milkweed, so it's gone from those habitats. So what we, what we need to do is kind of think of how much milkweed we've lost from those agricultural habitats and replace it in other kinds of habitats. But it's not as easy as it sounds when you think of planting milkweed, is it? Because not all the, the pods uh, produce many, many new plants. Yeah, well, so one of the things that we're really working on through the Monarch Joint Venture is to increase the availability of milkweed seed because a lot of people want to help and there isn't necessarily as much milkweed seed available mm. as people would like to purchase to plant in areas. So I think that that's, that's an area. So you have some milkweed here. I do. Uh -huh. I wanted to, we're getting tight on time. I wanted to be sure that uh -huh. we got to show you uh, what it looks like if you're not familiar. So this is um, a pretty garden variety kind of milkweed. Yeah, well this is actually a really interesting one. I was interested to see that you had this one. This is called Asclepias physocarpa. Um, some people call it swan flower. And this is actually what, mil what monarchs in Australia eat, huh. um, the caterpillars. So this one is not native to here, but this would be a great one. It would be an annual here and people could plant it. It has kind of a fun pod. So that's that's a great one, and then you have and I have a tiny this little one, one which too. this is a native one. This is this is called butterfly weed, and this has these amazing um, orange really flowers that, that are just beautiful and, and, and monarchs smell will eat this. Yep, they fragrant. smell great. So, you know, anything that there's a whole genus of plants called Asclepias. So anything that's Asclepias, monarchs will eat. Now this is very tiny. I just bought it yesterday. <laughs> Will it grow big enough to do any good this year, or is it a you know, perennial? It's a perennial. Okay, good. And um, monarchs will lay their eggs even on a small plant oh, like this. Will. So, yeah, I actually had some of these sitting in pots on my back deck the other day, and I went to plant them, and there were <laughs> eggs on them. Oh, that's so they'll good to they'll know. lay eggs on these tiny plants, and next year, you know, it's this plant is probably in its first year, but next year it, it'll be just a big, beautiful bush. Oh, okay. Yep. Well, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking it looks so much like something you'd yank out thinking it was a, a weed weed. Right. And I wonder if putting it in a pot would be better because then I can be sure that it doesn't get Yeah, or you could use the stake next to it. You could put this to, next to it, and I then next year... Remember. You'll yeah. remember that because yeah. next year it'll be this beautiful orange, orange just covered with orange flowers. Yeah. Well, that's great to know. So, go to your local garden store mm -hmm. and, and one buy thing, some milkweed. And buy milkweed. And one th thing to make sure of is that milkweed has not been treated with an insecticide. So, sometimes. Um, plants that are sold in garden stores have been treated with an insecticide a, called a neonicotinoid mm -hmm. and that gets into the whole all of the tissue of the plant so if a monarch caterpillar started eating a plant that had been treated with that it would kill it so certainly you need to ask and, and this source um, this is a native plant store that wouldn't treat their plants with neonicotinoids right. so I went to Mother Earth um, which right is so that would be a good source but it's, it's good to ask you know yes. the, if you ask the nurseries that will make them understand that people Care want, about want that. plants that aren't treated. Yes. Um, we're going to give you now some resource information and I want to um, give you some websites that we alluded to but I also want to give you um, a peek at, uh, well, let's do the websites first. 
I see they're up there. So we have three for you. The first one is monarchjointventure.org. This is a wonderfully inclusive, covers a lot of uh, resource mm -hmm. things within it. And it's really a partnership of monarch conservation efforts. Yep. So that's a really important one. And then this is Karen's baby. It's her monarch lab. And you go to monarchlab.org. And then we also have a third one that's your other baby here. Mm -hmm. And this is the uh, project she mentioned, the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. You can get involved with that. It's mlmp.org. Now, I want to quickly show you, too, a beautiful book that Karen said just came out in April mm -hmm. of 2015. And it's a book that she has written with two of her students, a current student and a former student. It's a wonderfully interesting looking book. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we were talking about what a job it is to do a book like this. And um, this is available via Amazon. Some Barnes and Noble stores are carrying it. Mm -hmm. I bet you can find it at the U Bookstore. Um, yes. So look for this, Monarchs in a Changing World. Thank you. <laughs> well, Karen, thank you so much. I wish you had more time. Yeah. Um, but I've learned a lot again, and um, I'm sure the viewers have too. So Good. It was, it was a lot of fun. Best of luck with yeah. your important work. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you for coming down. Yeah. yeah. Good. Thank you, too, for being with us. I'll be back again next week. Until then, have a good week.